my background, uh, my background in teaching has been in ministry with women for really nearly 40 years or so. And uh, the main kind of work that I've done is teaching scripture to women. And then I've also I've been uh, teaching other women how to lead. So a lot of leadership skills have gone into this. And then after that, my role became helping the person that helped the teachers. So I would travel to other classes with this organization and help those who were the teachers to be better at their jobs and training and, and teaching. So it's been pure joy for me. I feel like it's a great privilege. I, I don't think there's any better job that God gives people than to teach scripture to people who want to learn. I mean, who are there to learn. It's, it's a different thing than maybe a pastor. With, with, but, but for what I've done, it's people who are there because they want to learn scripture. And wow, what joy that's been for me. I think it's been a great privilege. And so I, I come to you today um, realizing that uh, part of what I've done is really, it hasn't been in my job description, or at least not at the title of what I was doing. The main part of what I've done is really mentoring. And mentoring is something that I think sometimes is just kind of along the way if we don't even realize we're doing it when we're in ministry. But mentoring is a big part of Christian work. And all of us are really called to be mentors. I think what's really kind of fun to see is that most people will say, well, oh, I'd really like to have a mentor. And you know, it doesn't matter how old you get, you still think to yourself, well, I'd like to have a mentor. But at some point in time in our Christian walk, even when you're young, you are really called to be a mentor to the people who are coming up behind you. So it's just what we see in scripture too, that, that we're, we're called to come alongside. That's what it is, it's to come alongside other people and to help them along in their walk too. So that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. And I, I think that the, the, uh, the calling that we see in scripture comes right out of the Great Commission at the end of Matthew. And we all know that it says that, that Jesus said um, that go and make disciples of all people, baptizing in, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have said to you. So the teaching them to obey is the part of it that sometimes I think we forget in the Great Commission. Evangelism is incredibly important to, to help people come to Christ, but if we don't teach them the rest of it, the part about obeying, then we don't. We haven't really given them the, the whole the, the whole part of what the calling is. So that's where mentoring comes in, and I love the picture of that in um, in the book of Luke in chapter twenty four, where we see Jesus on the road to Emmaus. We see the two disciples there walking along, and they were so discouraged. It says their faces were downcast, and. Um, <coughs> They, they, here they are walking along, and they suddenly someone's walking along with them. And he asks them, why, why are you so downcast? And they, then they pour out their hearts and weep about what has happened to Jesus. Now, there are already two things that we see there that are part of mentoring, alongsidering that we see, walking along with them, and then listening. Being a good listener, Jesus let them pour out their hearts as to why they were discouraged. So those are the two first things I think that I want to make sh sure that we understand about mentoring that we do. We, we walk alongside people and we listen to them. And then the third thing that we, that we see him do is he, he then begins to teach them from scripture. And we take people to the scripture. And so that's our third thing. And he gives them uh, all this information about why he had to suffer and all the prophecy from the Old Testament that showed that. And he's, he's really helping them to understand. Now, then we see another part of Fedrin in that they tell him, please come in and join us for a meal. 
and he joins them. He, he comes in as a guest. He's willing to take time away from his own whatever. Of course, that's what his whatever is, is to come alongside and, and have that time with them. And then the guest becomes the host as he breaks the bread and he, then he suddenly disappears from their, their view. And so that we have just the very foundations there that we see all through the New Testament of what mentoring is. It's the walking alongside, it's the listening, it's the taking the person to scripture, and it's spending time with them, taking the time out of your life to fellowship and be with that person in you know, the, the times where you could just be relaxed and enjoy each other. And I think that's a, a, a beautiful picture. Now, I want to come to the very last verse of that because as those two disciples were walking along and, they, and Jesus then left them, they asked each other, this verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Burning hearts. I love that picture of the burning heart. And it takes me to uh, to the book of Isaiah, chapter six. And you might think, what? what? Why are you going to chapter six of Isaiah? Well, in chapter six of Isaiah, that we had the time where Isaiah is commissioned. And this is what he saw. This is what he saw. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Just imagine that picture. And then we have the seraphim. And seraphim, by definition, means the burning ones. The burning ones. They are right there in God's presence, and they are the burning ones. And they've covered their faces with, their, with two of their wings because they are right there in the presence of God. And it's just they can't take in all that is of God there. What do these two passages have in common? Well, I think the burning part of it is in common, but why? Well, it is that intimacy of God, <laughs> that closeness with God, being right there in his presence that we saw with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and we see here as well, the intimacy with God is the first thing, that, that burning of desire to be with God. And then the second part of that is revelation in both places there is we see for the disciples it was the revelation that Jesus prepared as he gave them the scripture he gave them the revelation of who he was and of course for the seraphim they're they're he, they are in the presence of God he is revealed to them and that's why they've covered their faces so two things we see here intimacy and revelation that give that sense of burning, that desire, and that love, and that awe that we all want to have in our relationship with God. And what keeps believers from having that awe and that sense of, of intimacy with God and closeness with Him? We've all had those precious times with God where we have felt that we are right in His presence, hearing from him and knowing that he's spoken to us. Uh, so how, how is it that we, we don't seem to have as much of that as we'd like? And what does it take for us to come back into that kind of relationship where we, we know that our hearts are so in tune with his? Well, I think we have to put ourselves in a place mentally, physically first, and then spiritually, where we can't hear from him. This is commonly called the means of grace. And uh, the means of grace, it's kind of a funny term, isn't it? Because grace is not something we can earn. It's not something that we can do for ourselves. It's a gift. <coughs> and, and so, 
How do we have a means to grace? Well, the means of grace, as, as scholars would call it, is, is that time of Bible study and prayer, the disciplines of the Christian walk, um, the practices that we do, we have, and the habits that we make. And what I've seen as I've mentored a lot of women, I've really mentored an awful lot of women over the years. And one of the things I've come to realize is one size does not fit all. Now, do you have, ladies, when you shop here in, the, in Europe, do you ever come across a garment that has a label that says one size fits all? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that? I always chuckle to myself because it can't possibly be true <laughs> that somebody my size and somebody your size uh, would want to have the same garment. There's no possible way. Well, one size does not fit all when it comes to the process that happens to draw near with God. It's just not the same for, for any two. Uh, and so, uh, how then when we ask, if we're mentoring someone and we ask them, how is your spiritual life? Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to the person you're talking to? Does it mean, how are you doing in your Bible study? Does it mean, what's your prayer life like? Uh, you know, what, what kind of question does it mean? What's your inner life like? And so we really can't define our struggle very well sometimes. The struggle that we have, and not everyone's going to have the same difficulty either, but most of us do know from the hunger in our hearts and from our sometimes meager time with Him that we do need help. And even though there are times of trial and adverse circumstances that press us to God, put us back in that really close relationship with him. It doesn't always last when life gets busy and ministry gets heavy and we find ourselves letting the things uh, of those disciplines kind of slide. Uh, and the, the result of that is the lack of fruitfulness in our lives. Of course, we all know the gifts of the, the fruits of the spirit, you know, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and all of that, um, it is always worked out in relationship with other people. We, we can't just learn love unless we can learn love with other people because it's the love uh, of the difficult ones that really tests if we have love, you know? And, and peace or patience is always gonna be tried by the toddler or the teenager. And uh, so all of those fruits of the spirit that we are aiming for are worked out in relationships, aren't they? So uh, how do we become these fruitful, fruitful people that we want to become? <clears throat> well, John, John talks about this in John 15, where he talks about abiding. <clears throat> and abiding, uh, the word abide or the word remain in some versions appears over and over again. And he describes how our intimacy with him is strengthened as we abide in him. We, with word, verse 7, with prayer, verse 16, by obedience, in verse 14, and then in loving relationships. So it's, he describes we are strengthened by the word, by prayer, by obedience, and by loving relationships. And this is how we end up with fruit, much fruit, and and eternal fruit. So, but we, we can't do this by ourselves. It has to be in relationships. <clears throat> it has to be in relationships with other peoples. One, one person said it this way, people would not dream of tackling mathematics by starting to count on their fingers and toes, or by putting the science of physics together from their own observations. Uh, so, uh, as if we think about that, why do we think we can make our spiritual uh, pilgrimage on our own? Uh, once we have a sense of what it is for ourselves, then we have to be helping someone else to learn along the way. And I would imagine all of you have had mentors in the past. All right, so uh, we're gonna go ahead 
and talk a little bit about uh, how do we disciple people to maturity. We looked at the problems and the struggles, but now we're going to look a little bit at uh, how you go about uh, coming to a helpful end with this. So, <clears throat> how do we love, disciple, and lead others to spiritual maturity? And there's this really great article, or it's not an article, it's a talk by Ole Magnus Olafsrud on the FOPA website, and it's called Alongside Ring. Alongside Rick, he, he's a past president of Navigators. And um, he tells about a group of youth who were previously really tracking with the Lord, but then they fell away from their calling, at, from their previously burning hearts. And as it turned out, there were some reasons why. And this is kind of what, they, what the Navigators figured out was going on, that while these young people were serving, they had good affirmation but the affirmation was about what they did rather than who they were as people. And so when they fell away from the time of that intense serving, uh, they didn't have that same kind of affirmation anymore, and that was a problem. Plus, they saw Jesus more as an employer rather than as a friend. And they were also left far too much on their own without someone that came alongside them. And so navigators really realized that they needed to have their identity in Christ as a friend. And then they also needed someone with skin on who would also take an interest in them. And now all of us here are leaders of others. I mean, it's the European leadership conference. We're all leaders of others. And I think it's so easy to be consumed with our own service instead of our walk with our Savior. But then that's also what ends up happening with those that we mentor. It's, it's kind of a conundrum. They start to mature, then they get into ministry, and then it, it becomes busy, and then we don't have the same kind of walk with the Lord. So 1 Thessalonians, um, in chapter two, Paul is talking about the way that we are to come alongside. How do we do it? Well, he says we come along as a mother. And as a mother, it's gentle, caring, sharing wife, loving them. We're to come along as a father. And a father is the, the one who uh, encourages and challenges and in, and urges on to greater things. And then we come alongside as a brother or as a sister, uh, as someone to imitate. And so it, it, I'd like to just kind of give you an example of a, of a time of a person that I mentored. And, um, and if this one's a success story, and they are all. Um, this, this is a young woman from a country not in Europe. And she has come to the forum, but she's, she was in my year-round mentoring during COVID. So that COVID had good, pos good parts to it, and one of them was that a lot of people online that wouldn't have heard about the forum suddenly got connected. And this, is one of the, uh, this young woman is one of those that sh uh, she's from in the Middle East. And so uh, she came to this group mentoring. It was my year-round mentoring group. And so she comes to this group and the insecurity was just written all over her face because she was the only one uh, that was Eastern rather than Western. She was the only one who looked different than anybody else. And she had this sense of insecurity and it, you should have seen her face when she was warmly welcomed. She was warmly welcomed and she was loved on and it, it was as though she just was like a, a little flower opening up. And I began to have some one-on-one -on -one meetings with her because uh, I felt that was necessary. And uh, after the whole year of the year-round mentoring, uh, with most of the people, I'm, I'm done at the end of the year. And there's a lot that goes on there that helps them to grow and learn. But she just wanted more. And so I, I continued, I still meet with her. And 
This is, this is a young woman who wasn't sure what it was. Her life just was on fire. It truly was like a burning heart. And she, her pastor began to see the changes in her. And he finally asked, after a lot of things that she was helping with in the church, he asked her to t teach the class for the young adults. Now, the class for the young adults only had about four young adults. And two of them were the pastor's kids. <laughs> and so, but he wanted somebody to work with these young adults. And he <coughs> saw the, the fire in her, and that's what he gave her to do. And in the year and a half or so since then, that group has grown to be over 30. Over 30. And they are the similar, many of them are the children of the people in the church who were not coming to church anymore, who heard about it and started coming, and it's drawn <coughs> other kids in who were not Christian to start with, but who have become Christians. These kids have had scads of questions. She sends me questions sometimes, and we talk about possibilities of answers and how, you know, I, I say, what do you think it will, how do you think you should answer that? And uh, so that she thinks it through. It doesn't always come to me to answer, but how do you think, think it should, you should answer? And what has happened is that this, this work of mentoring, which has taken some of my time coming alongside, being a good listener, because she had a lot of struggles, personal and family struggles, being a really good listener, just like I said before, come alongside, listen, I took her to the scripture. We did Bible studies and then in the group and then personally with her. And, and then um, mentoring in the sense of giving her helps. And so this, it's the it's simplest thing, isn't it? It's the simplest thing. And I think sometimes we make it hard, but the, the difference in her life and then the lives that she's touching are really remarkable. Uh, I really think it came out of that loving relationship that was fostered in our year-round mentoring group. Now, I'd like to um, just kind of give you another method. I, all the mentoring that I, be, I have done over the years, I think I've done out of the training that I had through Bible Study Fellowship, but a lot of it has just come from the Holy Spirit leading, not really any real organization. As I've gone along, I've also found things that have helped. And I think that one of those is this one that I want to tell you about now. This comes from IFBS, which is an organization uh, here in Europe. And for mentoring, they, have, they call it the three C's. And everything that I look back at, um, as I look back at all the years I mentored before, I knew that there was actually an organized method to use. <laughs> I, I realized that this is what I've been doing for years, and I just didn't have a name for it. But the first one is, is called conviction or knowing. And that's the, that's the Bible. That's basically uh, having some theology and knowing the facts of Scripture, you know, just, just getting into the Bible and having real understanding and conviction and within the heart, actually knowing that the person is a believer and they have an understanding. So conviction or knowing. The second one is character, and that's the development of integrity in a person. So that's the being. And then competencies, which is development of skills, and that comes in the doing. Uh, now, that's the short version, but I'd like to look at each one of those a little bit more carefully. And uh, for the first one, conviction, obviously primary in that is Bible study. If, if we don't help the people that we mentor to have a love for Scripture and to see the need for being in Scripture on, on a regular basis, if we don't give them that, we haven't given them anything. Uh, so uh, the first things we we have to do is get into the Bible. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something here that's a negative, it, I'm gonna give you a negative example, okay, of something that, ha that, I, that happened with me. Um, I was I, in the church that I was a part of at that time. <clears throat> uh, 
they had a service that asked people if they could come forward and be baptized. And a young woman was baptized that day, and I got a call that they wanted me to mentor her because then she, you know, she just came forward and was baptized. So I was asked to, to meet with her three times. I thought, three times? You know, three times is, really isn't enough at all. Uh, but I, I met with her. Uh, I planned, I thought I'd be with her maybe six times over the summer. And I met with her the first time, and it was kind of get-to-know-you time. And we talked a little bit about a Bible study that she could do, one of the ones that you have on, on your seat. Very simple little Bible study that she could be doing. And I, we did a little bit of it together, and then uh, that was it for that time. We prayed together, and I went, I left, and then the, I came. It was very hard to get the second meeting with her, and I couldn't understand why it was so hard to find time for her, you know, that she could meet with me again. But we finally did. I persisted, and we met a second time. And by the time we were done, and I'm driving home from the second one, I'm thinking, I'm not sure she's saved. I'm not sure she's really saved. And so I had planned for the third meeting that we were, I was gonna, we were gonna really talk about salvation. And I tried for weeks and then more months to try to get back with her and she just did not, she would not meet with me again. And that was the end of it. And uh, I would text her once in a while and say, how are you doing? And I wouldn't hear a thing back. So, you know, I was completely, uh, rejected by her and uh, I knew that she wasn't saved and then it what going forward and being baptized was just a real mistake and to have that kind of thing happen is really a shame because she she thought she was saved well a year and a half later or so I was uh, up in front of the ch at the of the church at the end of the service on something they call a response team where they have some people at the front for they're ready to pray with people who want to come forward and pray about an issue. And so I'm up there after the church service and up comes this woman with her son and it's it's the same person, it's this young woman. And she's just a wreck in the year and a half since I'd seen her. She had gotten remarried. She uh, had moved out of the house she was in to another home in a different city, different town and her marriage was in total shambles. And she's coming forward because she was just so distraught and upset. And here she comes to me and I'm so happy to see her. And I'm, you know, pray. And then I, we, I let her, she talked it all out and we prayed and her son prayed. And then he went off and we talked longer and prayed more. We set up some times to, to talk further. And do you know, she never met with me even one more time. That was it. She never would do it again. Now, I don't know what, if anything, I could have done differently. But what I can tell you is, in our first meeting, I should have been sure, somehow made sure, that she was actually saved. And I didn't do that. You know, to just talk through what it is to be saved because I still, I, I'm quite sure this woman is not saved and I was not a help to her. So we don't want to have that kind of thing handled. So at the very start of any relationship that you have for mentoring, my, my advice to you would be to to ask questions about their salvation and try to hear some kind of a testimony from them of what has taken place in their heart. Re try and reach the heart. <clears throat> All right, so um, conviction, that is the first thing, to have the understanding of salvation. Um, and so one of the things you can do for a Bible study, uh, in fact, I gave, I put two on your chair. They're both really simple methods. One is, I, I call it the three-step method. They're both three-step methods. One of them is one that I use for year-round mentoring. Uh, and that's the one that is the, the two pages, or three, I guess it is. And then uh, 
The other one is just the simplest Bible study there is. And, and let me just say this. There are lots of things online that you can do. In fact, there's one called Word Go. It's, it has no spaces if you look it up online. Word Go, W-O-R-D-G-O. And it's, it's Bible studies you can get all, it's through Bible Studies Fellowship, but you can, you can get it uh, online. And, but these that I've just given you, if you could translate for uh, your people and all they need to do legal that they would use for use it for would be all they need is a Bible and a piece of paper and a pen. So you don't have to have a formal Bible study. And the reason I like this is because we don't always have a formal Bible study in our language, right? Uh, to, to have in our hands. But if we have a Bible and a piece of paper and a pen, everybody should be able to go to the Bible. And, and do a study. But these little three-step methods, the, the beauty of them is that they're so short and quick that it gets people into the Word because I, I only need to take 10 minutes to do one of these. You know, 10 minutes maybe. And, and we have no excuse <laughs> to not be in the Word of God. If we can get into the Bible and see some content understand that there's a lesson from it, and find an application for ourselves, we walk away into the morning, into the day, with something that God has shown us that day for ourselves. And the Word of God is supernatural. And we don't realize how God is going to use that Word that day. And we see it later in the day, and we think, oh, God gave me something for this woman. So it's for people to understand that it doesn't take time. Now, what happens with us as we become more mature, we're not satisfied with 10 minutes anymore. And if we want to take an hour, and, and that's fabulous. I have the time to do that because I'm retired. I can spend all the time I need in the morning in my chair with my cup of tea and my Bible and my extra books and my notebook. and. I can take all the time I want, but the vast majority of people don't have time for that. And if, if you make their Bible study a chore, then they're not going to get to it. But if you make it simple and, it's, and they see that they can do it and that they can, they can get it in their head and in their heart before they walk out the door in the morning, they are much more likely to do it. Then when they've got time, they can immerse themselves in it a little more fully. When they've got a slower day, oh yeah, I can take more time today. But if you can help them to see that they can get into it for a short amount of time and, 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 and watch the way God will speak, that is a great blessing. That's why I gave you those little, those little uh, options. Uh, but again, I want to say that one size does not fit all. And, um, I, and this has to have an example with it. So, and so here it is. I'm going to give you the example of two completely different ladies. The first one that I'm going to talk about, uh, she, did, she learned the three-step method, and she loved it. And you heard about this woman yesterday. She just glommed onto it, and she studied it. She loved it. She taught it to her friends at work. Then she taught it to some friends that were from her church, and there were people from those groups that started teaching it to other people. And this message, and this little simple method, just absolutely changed lives. Boom! Just started proliferating like crazy. And then she learned homiletics and the year-round mentoring, and then she learned how to give a lecture. And she she was so excited. Her father and her grandfather were pastors, and she had just got. I don't know if she inherited this desired her study and just had the mindset for it, but she loved it. It absolutely changed her life. Her pastor really noticed how she was growing and how she loved the Word of God, and so he had her show him what the three-step method was, and he started using it in the summer Bible study on Wednesday nights, and then he had her come every other Wednesday night so he could have the Wednesday off every other week and had her do the teaching, for the, just leading, it's not teaching really, it's just leading. 
leading the Bible study for the three-step method, and he could have those Wednesday nights off. And it became such a blessing, not only for her, but for her pastor, because he too was beginning, and he actually had her teach one other time but for, the, for their uh, Sunday morning. So um, just the simplicity of it is the beauty of it. And that's what will get people involved. Now, the second woman who's the other example that's a completely different, one size does not fit all, she's a woman that I met here, and uh, I recognized she really needed to met, have mentoring, more than just a meal together with mentoring. And so we covenanted to meet together every other week, and we met, for each, we met each other for over a year together. We were about a year and a half or so, and, um, she was, she was a past, she's a pastor's wife, and she really wanted to study the scripture, but she had studied the scripture as a pastor's wife for years, and she, what it, she was really depressed. She was really, it was as though she became a pastor's wife when she really didn't want that role. And I think in Europe that happens a lot. The pastor is the one who has the, desire for the theology and wants to be in the Bible and then the wife gets lumped in so the church gets two for one and the wife has to do all these duties in the church because she's a pastor's wife and maybe she's really not even suited to that. And that was the case with this woman. I finally began to realize with her, it took me a long time to figure out she's a very creative person, uh, with being leading Bible studies and doing women's things. Uh, it wasn't her gifting at all, and it was causing her to just be laden down with what wasn't her gifting. And I finally realized she's a very creative person, loves to work with flowers, and I said, I think you need to take some time and work in your yard and get your hands dirty and do your worship outdoors. And that changed her life. And it was God, it was God's leading, it was God's leading that she is a person that needed a different role. And she's, she does a for the church. She helps women and with understanding how to do gardening and what kind of things you raise for your family, and what will grow in their soil. And her, her life is entirely different. She's still got a kind of a ministry through her church but it's not the same as what I was sending her into with uh, the Bible study stuff. So uh, the, the leading of the Lord in the whole idea of one size does not fit all is really important. And it, sometimes it takes time to figure out what a person really needs. She still uh, needs to be in the Word, of, uh, of, in, the word in the Bible. And now let me give you a picture of, of what this is like. In Acts 15, Paul, remember Paul wasn't willing to bring Mark, John Mark along on the second missionary journey uh, because he had left them. He had left Barnabas and Paul and gone back uh, on that first missionary journey. So when Paul's getting ready to set out the second journey, he said, no, Mark can't come. He's not coming. But Barnabas, the son of encouragement, said he actually let his relationship with Paul suffer and took John Mark with him and went a different way. And I, I, the picture for us here is that it took time for John Mark to uh, mature. And I think we have to realize that uh, a long-term perspective sometimes is necessary. Having a long-term perspective and being willing to work with a person and we know that John Mark came around because in 2 Timothy, Paul says, get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. And so Paul is able to use John Mark with his, in his ministry later, even though Paul wasn't the one that helped him along. It was Barnabas. But Barnabas had that long perspective. And sometimes we think, you know, uh, we can be with a person for a year and mentor them and they're going to be they're going to be fine. But sometimes those have to be longer. They have to be longer term. We have to take the longer perspective and figure out what's going to work. 
All right, then I'd like to look at character next. And character is that developing of godly integrity. It's the sanctification process. And one of the ways that that happens is as we listen empathetically and imagine their problem as our own so that we really understand the problem we have. And I think listening is really a sacred gift. It being able to really listen to a person and to be able to hear more than just their words, but their heart and the, and the, the, the real, not just the, real, the felt needs, but the real needs that are there. And I think we need to be careful not to try and fix the problems, but to ask questions instead. Um, we have, for character development, we have to look at the relationship of knowledge to responsibility. They're getting the knowledge, but it's translating to responsibility. Um, that they learn that there's no compartmentalization of life, that, that God wants to enter into all parts of life. So developing integrity is connection of belief with behavior. And that's really the nitty gritty. That's where the rubber meets the road for mentoring is in this place of developing character. Um, and I think it comes out of asking good questions, asking really good questions. How do you see God leading you in this situation? Not trying to fix their problem, not trying to give them easy answers or just give them scripture, but ask them questions. Uh, what do you think Jesus, Jesus' invitation to you is in this? Um, and, and then the person that's doing the mentoring has also got to be vulnerable. We want the people that we're talking to to be vulnerable with us, but we have to be vulnerable with them too. They have to see us as human beings. And so uh, we have to be willing to express our own struggles and and the places where we hurt, and the places where we are um, having to go to God for our need. Um, another point that I really think we should make is that in mentoring, especially long-term mentoring, there no questions should be off the table. No questions should be off the table. Uh, that all parts of life uh, should be something that is the other person is willing to talk about. Let me just give you some examples of some of the things that I, uh, uh, I've talked about, topics, topics I've dealt with when I've mentored. Fear, nervousness, lack of personal self-discipline. Boy, that's a tough one when you're mentoring women. Worldliness, hypercriticalness, gossip, marriage difficulties, sexual problems, thought life struggles, self-esteem problems, prayerlessness, and godlessness. Now, Jerry Bridges defines godlessness as living without thoughts of God in the day-to-day. -day. Godlessness, where you go through the whole day and never think about God at all, and never thinking how he wants to enter into whatever the activities are. I've had days like that. Haven't you had days like that? When you come to the end of the day and you think, oh, I, I, I didn't even think about asking God about that situation. That's godlessness. And, and that can happen in our lives, and it can happen in the lives of our, those we mentor. So no subject is taboo when you have long-term mentoring. However, to make it work, there has to be complete confidentiality, total trustworthiness to never talk about that person to another person. Um, so another thing that you can do with people as you're mentoring them is to choose a book that will help with whatever their struggle is. So you, as the mentor, have to be really aware of what the resources are out there for you and to be looking for resources when you, when you need something new. All right, the last thing there is competencies. <clears throat> and uh, competencies, that's just really skill development. That's just helping them to develop the skills that they're going to need so that they can go on and do the same kind of thing you are. And so encouraging them to lead a small Bible study, uh, having them do one with you where they take on part of it, or they take a week 
and you're not there that week or you're there, but they lead and then you help them with what you saw and give them encouragements and maybe little tips and helps and then give them more responsibilities. So those are the kinds of things you can do. Um, you can help them practice how to share their faith with an unbeliever, practice on you so that you can help them with it and then continually return to scripture with them. Um, uh, one of the women that I've mentored is uh, dealing with a young woman in her, her adult group now who has told her that she uh, thinks she's going to be transgender. And of course, you know, uh, this is a young woman that's in her young adult group. And uh, so she has to, and she is not, that she made her promise before she told her that she would talk to her parents. And so she's, she's constrained from doing any talking about it, but just trying to help this young woman and she, to take her back to scripture and back to scripture and back to prayer and then to try and find the kinds of, of help within their society that they might have for this person. So the responsibilities be, can be great. They can be huge, but we have a great God we have a great God who is overall, and and we can we can pray for those resources, and He can show us what those things can be, and I and and praying for wisdom. Oh, we are told if we pray for wisdom that He's faithful to give us that wisdom if we don't doubt it. And I I experienced in my life that, that is true. He really does do that for us. <laughs>